Okay, I'm going to take advantage of the slight hush that has fallen over the room there. We're a couple of minutes early, but I think let's make a start. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for coming. My name's Imran Mia. Um, I'm going to be chairing tonight's discussion. Um, I am the director of the Social Market Foundation, whose logo you see up there. Um, we're a think tank based in London. Um, and our job basically is to take research that's done at CAGE and to vulgarize it um, <laughs> for the policy and sort of press audience um, yeah. in London. Um, and we've successfully done that with the latest CAGE policy report, Understanding Happiness, which I think you'll all have a copy of um, on your seats. Um, and so what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to allow each of our speakers around 10 minutes each to speak to their research. Um, and then I'm going to come out to you guys for questions to explore some of the aspects of the research. Um, the theme is understanding happiness, um, which is also the title of the report. And basically what the report does is it brings together um, a quite a long series of research papers which have been done here at the University of Warwick, um, most of them by people at this table, um, and um, gives you a sort of a, a summary of some of the key findings, but also sort of situates those findings within a wider discussion about what's been going on in terms of happiness economics. Um, so it kind of works as a description of some new research, but also I think for people who are new to thinking about happiness economics, so kind of as a primer to this subject. Um, the panelists are introduced briefly on that slide there, so I'm not going to kind of go through them in great detail. If you want longer biographies, then Google them, and you will find them very, very quickly. Um, I think they all also have Twitter profiles, other than Daniel. So Google Daniel, check Twitter for the others, um, and Daniel's going to speak first. So Thank Daniel, you. over to you. Thank you. I'll just uh, approach it. By the way, what we do know from happiness research is that too much social media definitely damages your happiness. That's a genuine finding, so um, you could take, try and control that if you can. And in particular, I very much hope you get a chance to have a look at the report. Um, we've done our absolute best to make it as interesting as possible. And as, as Hamran said, it, it acts as a primer to happiness economics. So those of you who haven't come across this before, please take a look. And I wanted to thank especially Karen Brandon, who's sitting over there, who was the editor, and worked very closely with a, with a group of academics who aren't always the best or the easiest people to work with to produce something as intelligible and as interesting as this. So thank you to Karen. Um, what I thought I would do is I would spend a minute or so introducing the broader work that we do at CAGE on happiness, so to perhaps to put the report into context and to give you a feel for the sort of things that we've been doing. So the report, of course, contains three pieces of work, but we do much more than that. So I think one thing we can do is we can break happiness down into four different strands. So the first might be an, a, an attempt to try and understand what influences national happiness. And that would include things like um, what I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, which is more about measuring happiness, but also includes some insights, I hope, into what drives happiness. But it would also include, say, Andrew Oswald's work um, on diet and how diet might affect national, national mood. Um, we also flip this in the other direction and try and understand how happiness affects behavior. And a good example of that would be the work that I've done with Eugenio and with Andrew on happiness and productivity, in which we try to understand how happier people behave in a, in a workplace environment. We found that they're much more productive, and we try to understand exactly why and how um, those changes take place. An important aspect of what we do at Cade as well is in measuring happiness. And it's no, no surprise that if you think back at the origins of macroeconomics, the origins of macroeconomics, of proactive macroeconomic policy, coincide with the development of a measure of GNP, of GDP. So, this, so national income accounting and active, proactive macroeconomics go together, and that's because you can't really control something, you can't think about something, unless you can measure it. This is a very important part of what we do. And finally, the impact on policy, something which uh, Gus is going to talk a good deal about, is something that we're very interested in at CAGE. So I'm going to talk a little bit about measuring happiness and, and the part of the report that is on your chair, that you may be sitting on if you haven't noticed it. And I think that if you want to cast your mind back to the 1930s, the history, of, the history of national income measurement, national income accounting, came out as a response to the Great Depression. So if you think about the 1930s, a period of, of misery, a period when people were looking around, they were seeing individuals in a great deal of poverty as a direct response of an economic disturbance. And one response to that was to try and begin measuring national income. The idea is if you can measure something, then you can respond to it. So if you think that it's 
drifting downwards, you can do something. And so you get the birth of proactive macroeconomic policy. And I think what I want to stress is that we're at a similar stage now. We're trying to understand a broader measure, something that perhaps captures things which national income does not. So even if you go back to national income accounting, the people who developed it, people like Simon Kuznets, for example, even at the very beginnings of this measurement, he talked about the limitations that national income has. It's not capturing everything we want if we want to look at true well-being. We're also going to want to include things which national income isn't going to get at. He talked about, for example, trying not to include military expenditure or there being disservices, things that might make national income rise but aren't necessarily going to be helping the well-being of people living in the economy. So I think it's a reasonable thing to say that we might want to measure happiness alongside income. But how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that through time? So the way we measure happiness right now is we ask people, how happy are you? And they give us an answer, and we try and build an index. But how, how are we going to measure happiness 200 years ago, 100 years ago? We can't go back in time and ask them, so we're going to have to do something a bit different. And our approach has been to borrow from a wide variety of different fields. So what we've learned from psychologists, for example, is that one way to get at the mood of individuals is not just to ask them, but to look at what they do, how they behave, and in particular, what they read. And that's the, that's the insight that we've drawn on the most. Now, if we believe that we can get at what people feel by looking at what they read, we could combine that with an explosion of big data. So we know, for example, that Google Books have digitized millions of books, hundreds of billions of words. So combine these two things, looking at what people read, the content of hundreds of billions of words worth of material stretching back centuries. We also believe that the market for books is very similar to many other markets in economics. Publishers act a little bit like middlemen. They're a bit like bankers. There's the great supply of books on one hand, and then there's a readership on the other, and they, they act to target books towards individuals who want to read those books. And if you put all of that together, we can start to build an index which measures happiness going back through time based on the mood that's present in books that have been published across the century. What we know is that this matches survey data really well. So where the two coincide, the 1970s, 80s, 90s, the two measures match extremely well. And that gives us the confidence to roll back our measure much further back than survey data can go. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is the raw data that our index produces for the UK. We've done this for six countries, and of course, um, we've filtered it and done all sorts of clever things with it. But this should give you an idea for just a general feel of what the index looks like. And you can see the great collapses in well-being that occur in World War I and World War II, and also a trend fall towards the winter of discontent um, in 1978-79. But just to give you a, a feel for what we're, what we're trying to, what, what comes out of our data, what we know is that in the short run, wars are incredibly <coughs> devastating. That shouldn't be a surprise, but the scale of the, of, the, of the effect is pretty dramatic. What is surprising is if you look to the long run, not the short run, uh, individuals' happiness bounces back pretty quickly after big negative shocks like wars, which is not to lessen the importance of, of wars because the stock of misery generated by those wars is pretty enormous. But one surprising thing is that income isn't particularly well correlated with happiness across the two and a half centuries that we've looked at. What is very well correlated with it is longevity, particularly well correlated with it. And longevity we take to be a general measure of mortality. So what that's telling us is that if you want to understand long-run changes in happiness, you have to understand mortality and what governments have managed to do to reduce mortality and what governments have failed to do to reduce mortality. So Direct policy ramification would be, if you want to tackle long-run happiness, look at things like road deaths, heart disease, things like that, things that are causing death, rather than focusing on small changes in, in income, for example. Final thing to say is that aspirations matter. It's not just the absolute levels of things. We know that happiness is a relative concept. How happy you are will depend upon how happy you were in the past and how happy you think you're going to be. It also depends on how happy you think the people around you are. So if you look at 1957, which is in the press a lot at the moment, as a date we talk about, part of that is looking back to World War II and thinking we're not in World War II anymore. The ration is over. And looking forward and thinking, well, prospects in the future have to be better than prospects than, than what's happened in the past. So we know that aspirations is another important piece in the puzzle. OK, I'll, I'll stop talking there and hand over to Argenio, my colleague, who will talk a little bit more about, about our work. Thanks, Daniel. We gathered the people in this huge survey, World Value Survey, uh, the World Value Survey, which is like 300,000 people per year, something very big. And we gathered everybody per quantile uh, uh, in terms of GDP of the 
country they live. So here there are people living in poor countries, typically Africans. Here are people living in the affluent countries, like the United States. <coughs> and we did this in order to avoid to impose any structure to, the, to this relationship, no? to let this relation be free as free as it can be. And also, we also purge this uh, relationship for any uh, fixed effect. So everything that is unchangeable during the year, like culture, language, people in different languages, and say different level of happiness, okay? These sort of things have been taken away statistically. So this is, I think it's a very clean picture of what's going on, of what's going on. Well, until $18,000 in purchasing power parity, we see that there is a positive relationship between GDP and life satisfaction. Okay? So the two life satisfaction and GDP tells a very similar story. After this level, let's say 18,000, things start to become a bit weird. You don't have any more this positive relationship. Maybe it flattens out, maybe you can see a bit of a some new shape, some newspaper talk about nadir of happiness. But I would say it's flattening out. So here in this in this in this in this situation, happiness and GDP tells a different story. Okay, different. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but they are two different stories. GDP and life satisfaction do not go move together. What does it imply this in terms of the policy? Well, if I am working at the World Bank or the Monetary Fund, International Monetary Fund, well, I wouldn't be too worried. They say, okay, fine, I look at GDP, more or less, when I increase this people's GDP, when I help to increase people's GDP, I will have to increase people's life satisfaction. Well, fine. But if instead of working at the World Bank or the Monetary FMI, I will work in, the, for example, the English Treasury, for now, it's still the UK treasury. <laughs> okay, sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get these nuances. Sorry, I'm Italian. <laughs> uh, okay, the UK treasury. Uh, I would be a bit worried about looking only at GDP because GDP doesn't go up with life satisfaction. This is the so called Eastern imbalance. Now, I'm not saying that life satisfaction, the GDP is not important, okay? That, that, that's a different thing we could discuss later about. It. But what is really important is to realize that GDP and life satisfaction here, at, this, at that, that point over, they say different things. They tell different stories. And probably we need to hear all of them. Now, there's another element that is more academic, but I think it's interesting and it's important. If I'm a neoclassical economist, are usual economists, the one people study you know, in the textbook. I look at the area and say, okay, fine, we are, we are getting right. People, reach, richer, people get richer, they get more happier, their utility increase. Uh, here, no. After that point, there is something which is not really explained by using the normal neoclassical or usual theory. You need to use something different which is called behavioral theory. And the behavioral theory says that people don't calculate their utility or their life satisfaction on level, absolute level, but on le their level relative to some something else. Utility here becomes a relative concept. And what matters is not very much how much you earn, but how much you earn with respect to Mr. Jones, okay? With respect to your neighbor. At this stage, you see that uh, GDP increase, my wealth increase, Mr. Jones' wealth increase. Not a big deal. I'm not getting any, any more happy. Okay? At this, when people are poorer, no. People are too busy to starve, to avoid starving. So they don't really pay attention to Mr. Jones. So in this, in this respect, in this part <coughs> of the curve, people seem to be more neoclassical. Okay? So this is the first paper I wanted to talk. The second paper uh, is uh, actually with Michela uh, Redoano and Federico Liberi. And Michela is here, we've been waiting. <laughs> and it's about 
the relationship between happiness, so an emotion, and voting. What we show here is using the British House of Panel is that when people are happier, they tend to support the incumbent party, more, more likely to support the incumbent party. Okay? So if, if I'm less happy, I support the incumbent party less. If next year I become happier for some reason, I support the incumbent party less. Um, this is quite sizable. Uh, people more satisfied about their life increase their, uh, it's, they are 2% more likely to support the Prime Minister party. <coughs> Now, 2% is, doesn't look huge, but it is big. It is big because we know that in some constituencies, very little margin can determine defeat in the victory. So it's, it's a sizable amount. And what, what does it say? It says something important. That, uh, on top of that, it says something else. Even if you control for objective circumstances, like your income or your financial, perception of financial situation, or everything you can measure, well, happiness still affect your voting behavior, which seems to show, seems to suggest that the emotion in itself push people to vote for the incumbent in this case. So emotions play a role, and I say this is a bit scary, because it's difficult, right, to control emotions. So this is a bit scary, maybe it's a failure of our democracy that we need to consider the technical account very seriously. Now let me conclude by, I say, why policy maker, why people should pay attention to the index of well-being? Well, policy makers can better target people's needs, like we show in the rich country, the most developed country. And politicians can get their jobs. So a good reason for them to pay attention to this. Thank you, Eugenia. Um, so you started there by beginning to talk about some of the policy implications of happiness research. And our next panelist, Gus O'Donnell, I think is going to continue that theme. So over to you, sure. Gus. I will not be giving you death by PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> it's great to be here back at the university that I actually studied at, first of all, uh, did my first economics degree here, where they taught me neoclassical economics and that uh, basically what economics was about was maximizing utility, which is a function of income. If everyone's income goes up, then everyone's better. And society was simply a sum of everybody's income. So if you wanted to get society better, then you increased incomes. Straightforward, but wrong. Um, so uh, it's good. I think this subject is a classic example where lots and lots of disciplines coming together can actually enhance this subject enormously. Because you'll have seen already some aspects of health being talked about here. Uh, politics, uh, which you talked about, there's psychology, there's behavioral aspects to this, and there's lots of other things. So when we put these, all of these disciplines together, uh, I think we can make real progress. And I think the, the important part for me of this report will be trying to get as many different disciplines interested in this subject as possible, to take it out of a narrow sphere. So I've just come back from uh, a, mostly a holiday in a country called Costa Rica. The thing about Costa Rica is it's fabulously happy. Um, I've got the t-shirt which says they're the happiest country in the world, which actually technically is not true. Um, <laughs> but hey, we're in a post-truth world, so uh, <laughs> what the heck. But they are very, if you look at the World Happiness Reports, which I stress uh, are worth a good look, then on life satisfaction, uh, they come out very high. Uh, you mentioned about taking military spending out of GDP. Uh, well, wouldn't make any difference to Costa Rica, because in 1948 they abolished their army. Um, <laughs> So they don't have any spending on military, which is interesting. Uh, and they do have a very equal distribution of income uh, compared to others. So quite an interesting background. In terms of policy, uh, I will go back to uh, what, what Daniel said about measurement. Measurement is hugely important. And that, that, that Simon Kuznets doing that work to measure GDP really did help economics start to think about what kind of policies might we do. Keynesian policy about Keynesian uh, Stabilization of GDP, you know, in recessions, let's spend some more government money to try and bring up employment, all of those sorts of things. But if you haven't got any measures, you can't really do anything. So imagine me as cabinet secretary. I walk in to see the then head of the opposition, David Cameron. Uh, this is back in 2010. 
right? We have a system in our country where we can go and talk to the people who are the main opposition parties to talk about the kind of policies they'll institute when they go in. I thought we were going to have a kind of boring conversation about precisely how many special advisors in number 10 and all those sorts of things. Actually, he said, I'm really interested in this well-being idea. And uh, I was quite taken aback because I had thought I couldn't get politicians interested in this whole concept of a broader measure of success. Now, uh, his ideas were quite rudimentary in a sense, but he did think that this was quite important. And I said, well, great. Uh, if you think that, the number one thing to do is to start measuring it. And so he said, OK, well, that's one of the things we should do. Then had a conversation with him and, and his special advisor guy called Steve Hilton about behavioral stuff. And again, they got, to my surprise, were very interested in behavioral stuff. It was starting to come through 2010. We're starting to have a lot more emphasis on behavioral economics and the whole um, undoing project, the Michael Lewis book, which is a fascinating way of getting into it. Uh, and so uh, the behavioral stuff was coming together, which was very interesting because behavior change was, again, multidisciplinary, but a way of saying, actually, here's a way of influencing policy which isn't the kind of traditional, you know, traditional policy levers are let's change interest rates or let's spend more money on health or education. Well, actually, the great thing in 2010 was, as the departing chief secretary had said, that envelope that he left for the new person, there's no money left, right? So we needed policies that would actually change things without spending any money. And actually, the thing about a lot of behavioral stuff is it's relatively cheap. So why would you want to change behavior and this is where the behavioralists have, I, I think, slightly lost it, is you want to change behavior to increase well-being. So the well-being stuff is absolutely fundamental to the behavioral stuff. And it's interesting that guys are getting uh, Nobel Prizes for behavioral stuff, like Danny Kahneman, and actually, why do you want to change this? And if you read Danny's books, it's about well-being, even though Danny himself has moved all over the place on the whole well-being story. So, uh, so I thought well-being is very important. I did a report at the Legatum Institute on well-being where I got in some economists together uh, and David Halpern, who ran the Behavioral Insights team, to try and bring these things together. Angus Deaton was one of the people on that. And the next year, Angus gets the Nobel Prize in Economics. Now, that is a correlation. It is not causal. <laughs> um, I didn't mention that, that particular piece of work. But, but I like to think that it shows that the world is understanding that this stuff matters a lot. So, measurement. We get the, uh, fortunately, being in government, you can do these things quite quickly. If you've got a prime minister that decides it's important, so the Office of National Statistics start measuring the four key things, uh, life satisfaction, overall how worthwhile is your life, how happy were you yesterday, and uh, anxiety levels. Four elements uh, which measure different aspects on uh, different ways of thinking about happiness. They went around the country and talked to people about what mattered to them. And Andrew Osborne and I wrote a paper which is mentioned in the report about how you might think about bringing these things together. As was mentioned earlier, the interesting talk about well-being statistics is they're ultimately incredibly democratic. The point about industrial production is the ONS give you the number, right? Because someone's given it to them. Actually, subjective well-being numbers come from you. It's all of your estimates. And we add them all up. Uh, and we can't, you know, muck around with them. And as you say, it's a bit scary. You know, I have this theory now that uh, Iceland basically caused Brexit because Iceland knocking England out of the Euro 2016. <laughs> we're all deeply unhappy. Uh, and yes, it's not uh, causal, yeah. but hey, yeah. we're unhappy, so we vote for Brexit. That's a new theory on Brexit, right? <coughs> Probably haven't heard that one yet. Um, so I think this... It was this, a Brexit. Huh? It was a Brexit. It was, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, indeed, it was definitely a Brexit. It was really a profound Brexit. Now, uh, so measurement. So we got the four questions measured, uh, and, and that's happening. And then the next part was, how do we get this to influence policy? And that's the kind of area where it starts to get difficult. Because um, when, you, when you do traditional policy, and you're looking at a policy to say, so is the introduction of a new drug uh, worthwhile or not? Basically, we've got, we economists have come up with cost-benefit analysis. Is, is it worth building that road or not? Is it worth 
putting a crash barrier in the middle. And if you put the crash barrier in the middle, you're going to save lives, you're going to reduce uh, injuries, uh, but it's going to cost you this much. So you start having to value things. You start having to value life and injury and all that sort of stuff. And actually, if you really want to appraise, you know, if it is a new drug worthwhile, uh, well, what difference is it going to make? Well, it might give people three years more quality life. So you have quality adjusted life years to use. So you have all of this analysis, basically, fundamentally, trying to get at the concept of, is it going to improve well-being? And is it going to improve well-being enough? So this whole question about how do you value an extra, you know, I call them well-bees, well-being years, slightly different to qualies, quality adjusted life years. But there's, there's an element there. But Ultimately, when we take this policy from where it is now, and I'd say we're on the nursery slopes, or maybe even the fetal slopes of where we need to get to, uh, to where it will be, we'll be in a world where we've done the kind of things that NICE does routinely for uh, introducing a new drug to lots of policies. They've been applied in specific areas. If you looked at, say, the National Citizens Service, uh, which is a policy to try and uh, do all sorts of different things, but what we've done with it is to measure people's well-being before these are kids going off, mixing with kids from different social backgrounds, trying to improve their confidence and their aspirations and things like that. And we measure their well-being before they go on it, we measure their well-being afterwards, and then we measure it a year later to see if there's any sustained impact. And it's one of those policies that actually has turned out to have a big sustained impact on well-being. So that makes you think, okay, so if you do want to enhance the well-being of society, and, and you look at the things which influence uh, well-being, uh, as you say, employment, income at lower levels, lots of other things, relationships, and all the rest of it, it gives you a policy agenda. When you look at the way policy is driven at the moment, you take education policy, right? And then what, what do we do in education? At the moment, we, we say to people, well, what really matters is your exam results, because that's what we measure we measure it unbelievably in schools, right? We do lots and lots of A to Cs at various levels because we have this theory that if you get exam results, then you get good jobs and you earn a lot of money, and money is obviously very important. Actually, turns out it's not. For your well-being, what matters? Uh, well, actually, then you start thinking about, oh, say, if we want to educate people to have high levels of well-being, one of the things that comes out of it is you want kids to be very resilient. You want to be able to accept these shocks but, you know, the, uh, that Second World War, First World War shot, to be able to bounce back. So you're really interested in, A, measuring their well-being. And if we had, you know, one policy that I'm desperately trying to get through is saying to the schools, for God's sake, stop spending quite so much time on testing in terms of exam tests. Let's measure the well-being of the kids. Difficult. And then let's start thinking about, can schools uh, be incentivized to try and improve the well-being of their kids. Turns out that those kids with higher well-being actually earn more. It's a better predictor than educational qualifications. So um, that's quite interesting. Uh, and obviously both go together to some extent. So that's the kind of thing in terms of education policy. If we went to um, policies on, say, uh, farm and work and pensions, one of the things is so... Uh, we're in an ageing society, as you said, mortality, really important. We are actually getting people up, you know, 100-year life book, quite interesting on the fact that, you know, people born now, probability, more than 50%, they'll, they'll live for over 100 years. How do we ensure those, those older periods are high-quality periods? And there's really interesting ways you can do that, but one of the things we've found is a very big impact, negative impact on uh, well-being is loneliness. And when you think about the way we're improving, uh, modernizing public services, one of the things we do is we digitize them. We, so we go to new technology, you want to uh, do your car tax, you do it online or you do it on the phone. You don't have to go anywhere, pension credit, you do it online or on the phone. Actually, quite a lot of what old people enjoyed was going to talk to somebody in the post office or in the pension credit office about that. And one of the things we need to think about now is in the next age of reform of public services, are we kind of reducing their cost, quotes, in very narrow terms, but actually missing the point? We're damaging the well-being of those people. We're reducing social interactions. So there are ways of thinking about these things which we need to think about. I could go into many, many more uh, examples, but, uh, but uh, another one, let's go one final one, 
careers guidance. Turned out to be really important. When uh, I was at Warwick and they said to me, you know, what do you want to do after this? Um, I said, well, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, give me some advice. And uh, they tell you about careers and they tell you about how much you'd earn in the different careers because that's objective, clear, promotion structure and all the rest of it. But actually, wouldn't it be nice if somebody said to you, do you realise people that have gone into this career have really high levels of well-being? They're really happy. They feel that their lives are satisfying and worthwhile, which is, of course, why you should work for the Government Economic Service, Sir Dave Ramson, who are here, rather than um, someone else. I can't, I can't mention my own firm, because obviously we look after the well-being of our uh, staff incredibly well. Um, so I think thinking about that, where you give careers guidance, saying to people, actually, you know, what is really going to make you satisfied? What are the things that turn you on? You know, do you get really turned on by saying, you know, today I, I sold a lot of subprime mortgages and I made a fortune? <laughs> um, or do you get turned on by saying, actually, today, you know, I, I invented a way that older people can interact with other older people and, you know, these people in their 70s can start helping people in their 90s because actually they're more digitally literate and they can help them get onto Skype to see their grandchildren and to order their uh, shopping, uh, mobile shopping and all that. So helping people who've got mobility issues and, you know, you can get to a stage where all of these things come together. So there's an enormous amount of policy change that can come to this. I'm delighted that we're picking up the politics that actually... You know, this will get you re-elected, because that will work with politicians, <laughs> believe me. My experience suggests they're really, really on there. Um, we do have some problems. We need to think about intergenerational issues and interpersonal issues. You know, how much do we care about pushing the overall average level of well-being up, or is it inequality and well-being they really care about? Personally, I think that taking the people who are really desperate and helping them has got to be the number one priority. What, what is it that we know about them? Nearly all, it's mental health problems. So, policy conclusion number one, by one thing I keep bashing home to people, is the health budget should be reallocated to spend more on mental health uh, relative to physical health. Thank you. Um, got one supporter at least. Uh, and, and that would increase well-being quite dramatically. And, and we, we've now got uh, some statements from government saying they give equality to these two things, but the money isn't there. And that will make a huge difference uh, to, I think, uh, well-being of society. So that. The other interesting fact, and it's just a correlation, is when you look at the Brexit vote, I'll, I'll end with this, and you look at those areas, because we have data by area, uh, most of the stuff written on, on why people voted for Brexit is, to my mind, just completely made up because we don't know how people voted. We do know how areas voted. So when you look at the spatial data and you look at uh, the areas that voted uh, leave, most likely to vote leave, they're areas of very high inequality in well-being. Not inequality in income, inequality in well-being. And that's kind of something to think about in terms of why were people kind of feeling that the world had left them behind? Uh, and it wasn't just income. And if you try it with income, it won't work. So it's a, it's a fabulous future. Uh, we're not there yet. And you know, I think in terms of David Cameron making that commitment to measurement, that's fantastic. Because we'll get the data, we'll be able to do the analysis, do the research, work out what really works and what doesn't. And in the end, governments will catch up. I feel quite confident about that. But it will need the work of many disciplines coming together to actually start to say and demand of politicians that they start doing the kinds of policies that will actually make a real difference to the well-being of society. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Um, so Gus spoke for longer than his allotted time. Um, but he used to be the head of the civil service during the time that I was a civil servant. So he used to be my boss's 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 boss. <laughs> so I couldn't quite bring myself to tell him to stop. Um, anyway, people seem to be enjoying it. Um, I forgot to push the stopwatch button. <laughs> um, we've lost the slide which introduces everyone. So in case people have forgotten, um, our, our final speaker, um, Sir Dave Ramson, is the chief economic advisor at the UK Treasury. Um, and he's going to round off the discussion. So over to you. Um, Thanks, and um, got, Gus has uh, been my boss at various times in my career, and uh, I've, I've got used to having to create space and time for him. <laughs> uh, um, 
But, uh, and, and, uh, but I'm now doing a job that he used to, uh, he used to uh, do, do fantastically. So um, I hope you'll understand, um, because I'm still a civil servant and chief economic advisor to the Treasury, I might be a bit less uh, interesting uh, and thought-provoking than Gus. Um, but I hope that uh, what I have to say will usefully round off a great set of... Um, Presentations. I just want to comment a little bit on the um, on the on the uh, cage report today. This one, um, and also then go on to say something about uh, the government economic service, which, as well as uh, being chief economist in the treasury, I'm head of the government economic service. The the, ap the applications that we make of well-being analysis in in policy. I mean, I'm. Um, I think that's the key thing about this. Uh, what, I mean, Daniel called this a primer, and, and it, it actually serves an awful lot of functions. So, so if you, you know, this this would be the book I'd start with on on well-being because it's the the chapters really do prime you um, for getting up to speed on well-being. But it is a policy report, and I think that's what's really nice about it, where it really adds to the the literature already out there because. It is trying to be a practical use. It's taking the research, and it's got a terrific uh, bibliography at the end with all you know, properly referenced, and offering some perspectives and some tools on how that can be applied in the policy field. And you know, just running through um, the, two chap the two main chapters before we get on to what the Government Economic Service is doing in this field. I mean, I'm a macroeconomist by background. I completely focus on the macroeconomic data. I love data, and it is, it's fantastic uh, now that we have different types of data on well-being. So we've got, um, as Gus was saying, and as others have said, we've got the ONS data collected since 2011, uh, an incredibly comprehensive data set at the, U at the UK level. Uh, but also at more, you know, many more detailed levels. And, you, and, and it is, a, it is a, a treasure trove of data that you get from that. For example, when you look at that, you see that Northern Ireland consistently scores better than other regions on, on, on the four subjective well-being indicators that are collected. Um, yeah, whatever's going on in the other economic trends. I mean, as I say, I'm a macroeconomist, so I look at every number coming out every day and have to... Uh, explain what's going on to other people in the Treasury. And now the ONS are publishing their data on a quarterly basis. So back in January, uh, within a fortnight of each other, we had the GDP numbers for the end of last year, gross domestic product, you know, going back to Kuznets and national income, working out where the economy was on that metric at the end of last year. But on January the 13th, we had all the well-being numbers up to September last year. And you can begin now to look at the world beyond GDP, more like in, in real time. And what we heard from Daniel was about this amazing longer data set that's been developed using um, you know, big data techniques. And as Gus says, I think the interdisciplinary nature of, of the well-being agenda is one of its many strengths. Um, I would recommend, look at pages 78 and 79 of this. I mean, you can even look at them now since I haven't got any slides to, to show you. But, you know, incredible, the valence ratings, the values that are put on different um, words. Vacation has the highest score, 8.53 out of, I think, 9. Um, the number 8 has a score of 5.37. I don't really understand that. Stress scores 1.57. You know, the similarly low score to unhappiness. Um, but you begin to see the power. You, I mean, what's great about this little document is you can see how the data is put together to then to sort of inform the kind of big conclusions that Daniel was coming out with. That, you know, actually, you know, particularly the Great Depression, but big recessions, big periods of instability really matter for well-being. That links very strongly to the kind of literature around you know, labour market disruption, unemployment, how significant that is, you know, for example, relative to, to national income. Um, 
Eugenio didn't talk about it today, but his chapter's got a lot on the genetics and happiness. This is an interesting area to get into, and it focuses on the experience of Denmark. Um, but it, you know, it suggests that up to about a third of, uh, of scores for countries can be explained by genetics, but that leaves two-thirds where policy and political choices have a huge part to play along with other conditions. Now, what I then want to now talk about is what the Government Economic Service is doing in the field of well-being analysis and in terms of applying it to policy. And if you'll bear with me, I just want to give you a two or three practical examples of where we are using the data, taking it into our analytical techniques to help inform policy decisions. First one, appropriate since we're in this arts um, centre, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport have successfully applied methods of well-being valuation based on exactly the kind of survey evidence and data sets that we've been talking about today, linking those to survey evidence of visits to cultural institutions to inform their bids for investments, and that's actually strengthened DCMS's spending <coughs> review evidence. It allowed them to show the, the evidence of wider societal um, impact on well-being of places such as this, over and above traditional willingness to pay approaches, which are, if you like, the kind of core of things like the cost-benefit analysis approach enshrined in the Green Book. Gus has already talked passionately about mental health and well-being. And I think this report, again, it's, it, it just shows how strong uh, a driver of well-being mental health is. And that has prompted successive recent governments to focus on it. The Prime Minister gave a speech last month that had mental health at its centre. And when she was talking about the importance of mental health support in the workplace, that was evidenced by analysis carried out by the business department, and which was actually very similar and informed by the kind of work that Daniel and Andrew Ellswald and others have done on the link between happiness, uh, well-being and productivity going back to 2014. So here's an example of the kind of analysis in this book that you heard about, which is then linking right through to the top of government and the, and the agendas that are being put in place. I could give other examples about the role that um, analysis of well-being has played now in housing, where you know, um, a report by Department for Communities and Local Government last year identified the impact of housing on well-being based on the English Housing Survey. And this, again, helps strengthen the evidence base for policy on housing quality. Now, where all this is coming together, as I, as I was implying, is also in the approach that we take to cost-benefit analysis, to appraising projects across government using the, the, the manual for this uh, called the Green Book, which we're refreshing later this year. And this is going to, for the first time, welcome the use of well-being in the early stages of policy formulation as a source of evidence that supports policymakers in defining the purpose and scope of interventions and in designing solutions. We're going to be more cautious at this stage about advocating its regular use in the formal cost-benefit analysis. And then you know, that comes to some of Gus's points about where we are in the process here. But this is still you know, a material development. And I think the key point I would just leave you with is you know, as we further and further integrate well-being analysis, we have to make sure we apply the same rigorous standards to it as we do to the other statistical techniques that we use. So I hope that's given you a flavour of the kind of approaches that we're using across the Government Economic Service. And I think you know, as we refine the data, build, build the evidence base, we will be a, you know, it will have more and more of an impact on policy making. But we're already making really material progress. So thank you very much for listening to that. And now very happy to join the panel to take questions. Also very conscious that I, you know, the link earlier that was made between well-being and social media, because the last time I did one of these panels, I got back to my uh, Twitter account to find that I had more notifications than I'd ever had in a single day. So uh, anyway, so don't ask me any difficult questions, please. <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks very much, so, um, so as I said at the beginning, I'm going to come out to you for questions. There's one question that I won't resist asking myself, which I think is a question for our first three panelists. So I think in all of your remarks, what we heard was um, you took the opportunity to make the case for happiness economics, for well-being economics, and, and absolutely you should. That's, that, that, that's what we're here to discuss. Um, but Dave, in his remarks there, talked about how when government is reviewing its methodology for how it assesses projects and, and policies, it isn't yet going to use happiness economics as part of the cost-benefit analysis. And I guess that, for me, just raises the question that for sort of our first three panelists, what's the area in which you think well-being economics still needs to move forward? What's the kind of what's the, what aspect of well-being economics or happiness economics sort of gives you sleepless nights? Where do you think it needs to become more rigorous? Um, you sort of you know you did lots of the cheerleading for this for this brand of economics. Um, where do you think it still has a way to go? Okay. So Daniel first. Sure. So I, I think measurement is really important. So I think that um, my, my I think subliminally in, in, in what Dave was saying was that we still have some way to go to approach the sort of rigor that we have in measuring national income. So one good thing about national income is we have a lot of data and we have a pretty clear understanding of, of how it moves through time. Once we get to that point, and we're, we're, I think we're almost there with well-being, but we have to convince people that we can measure it accurately in, a many, in many different ways. These different measurements are relatively consistent. When we have that, I think that government and more people will be happy to incorporate happiness into, uh, in, into cost-benefit analysis. I think we also have to be a little broader. We have so many different ways of measuring national income. We look at growth rates, we look at income distribution, all these sorts of things. And we have to do more in happiness in, in this sort of way. We have to look more at uh, the happiness distribution at growth rates and at different ways to control for various things and what, it, what exactly it correlates with and all these sorts of things. And as we get more and more confident in our use of it, I think the, the pressure for government to make extensive use of this will be overwhelming and government will be happier to do so because it will feel more confident um, with, with what we're doing. Eugenia? I think we have to be careful with index of well-being because the problem, main problem at the moment is that they are good at measuring big shocks but they are not particularly good at measuring small changes like cancer research. You don't have breakthrough in cancer, you see, you have a small a steady increasing and these things do not get captured by the index of well-being people do not really perceive this little change this is a bit dangerous you see because uh, if you push too much this idea of a policy well-being driven policy you end up to maybe not to think about this small but important change like cancer research so for me this is the big big problem at the moment of this day yeah so it's good at observing big changes not yes. yet so good at observing smaller changes yes. yeah and that's dangerous yeah Gus what about you so two points I've made you put it in the context of well-being economics and I, I hope what I was saying at the start was let's not go mm. there so it's a bit like behavioral economics I, I made the point that it wasn't going to be the behavioral economics yeah. team it's behavioral insights team because we wanted it to be multidisciplinary mm. Mm. We wanted more than the economists in there yeah so I think it's about approach to well-being I'd also say the thing about GDP is is we, we got better and better at very accurately measuring something that isn't a welfare measure um, so we've just changed GDP to add in uh, prostitution and illegal drug activity so if they go up, GDP goes up. This is a good welfare measure. Uh, we should stop doing volunteering, which isn't in there, and we should all take to the streets, right? Um, <laughs> this is crazy, right? So, um, so let's never think that we've got it right with GDP. The great thing about GDP is that we've got a long data series, and therefore we can do lots of time series analysis. And we've got countries where the UN has put down some laws so there's relatively comparable numbers. OECD are trying to do the same for well-being, but that's why I said with David Cameron, the one thing, you know, when we look at his legacy, probably won't be about Europe uh, <laughs> in a positive way, but the fact that he started measuring the uh, well-being series, you know, in 10, 20 years' time, we'll have great data. You know, how does well-being vary over the economic cycle? We don't really know in the UK. I mean, we've got some data series, but I'd say, you know, having one that's now got an official statistic classification, which ONS data has, uh, 
And measuring that through time will give us some great data and it's quite large sample sizes and it's proper. So I think that's, that, and that's why I agree with the point about, that's why I described it as the fetal slopes. You know, we're, we need to be quite careful because we, we just haven't been doing this for long enough. Thank you. Okay, over to you. Um, <coughs> questions from the floor, please. Yeah, one back there. Go ahead. I'm, I'm completely uh, sold that uh, that um, uh, GDP is not happiness. Um, it probably wasn't, never meant to be happiness in the first place. It's a quantitative measure, um, and uh, uh, we're not sure how to increase GDP for sure, but. Uh, what, uh, I heard what happiness, that happiness is important, is not correlated with GDP, and that's great. How do you, how do you increase happiness, however? So how would you say to a politician, what's a policy that would increase happiness? Or somebody was mentioning kindergarten or, you know, teach people. How, how do you do that? And what, point, what are the main points to emphasize to, you know, as a policy implication of this happiness so the question was about how do you actually go about increasing happiness? What are the kinds of, what do we know about what policy measures or other things work in terms of increasing happiness? Let me try and capture another couple of questions before I come back to the panel. Um, if you'd like to come in, yeah. So a couple over here, this gentleman first in the blue shirt, yeah. Just to bring you more kind of global analysis story. So basically, one thing is quite tangible in the world, Policy level, healthcare or well being is not a priority. I mean, some men's own economic growth, maybe more growth, more infrastructure. So that's it. I think that will help. And the second thing is the behavior aspect. So it's the demand side as well. For instance, not good diet, I mean, the availability of proper food, and so on. So, how is, how is it? What kind of implication we draw from this survey that where this emerging world should go? Okay, no, thank you. Very interesting question. So the question is essentially about what does thinking about well-being, what does it suggest in, for low-income countries in particular? Uh, what does it suggest for the kind of choices that they should be making in policy terms? All our questioners so far have been male. Um, so I'd quite like to change that. Um, <laughs> so if you're waiting to ask a question and you are male, you might not get picked. Um, <laughs> And please, others, could they volunteer questions? Um, so I'm going to come to the panel. Um, Dave, can I start with you? Um, completely agree on, on the, 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 the gender point. It is a real issue, though, with UK economics. Uh -huh. um, as I, I've, I've been saying repeatedly um, in, my, um, in my time in this role, the, 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 the facts are that two-thirds of of um, UK economists are men and a third are women, whereas the, obviously this panel it's 100%. <laughs> um, but, um, and I'd happily give up my place for the really tricky questions if there's any woman who'd like to come on the panel. <laughs> ah, yes, yeah. we were talking earlier, that would be fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that I saw a, a, a complete 50-50 gender split of uh, cage researchers earlier, so that was good. Um, so in terms of answering or, or starting to answer the questions, I mean, I think, uh, I'm j just I'll make two remarks. One, really just to reinforce points that Gus made in his presentation, that for a given level of income, I mean, if you can tackle things like mental health, if you can tackle things like loneliness, there's a really good evidence base that um, you, know, you can improve well-being across pretty much all the dimensions. I mean, interestingly, in the first chapter of the book that I think Gus put together with Andrew Oswald based on, they looked at, you know, what trying to suggest what some preferences might be for policymakers in the, the things you weigh differently, whether you put a big weight on anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, how worthwhile you feel. And I think that's the kind of, you know, that gets you into, you know, what is your preference function as a government or a country? 
you could start to adopt that kind of approach. I mean, what I'll say now more from a, you know, this will sound more like a kind of classic uh, treasury approach, and it does come on to the questions, I think, about um, developing economies and lower income economies and how you, how you prioritize. I think my, where I still see at every level of the um, of income, you know, I do see a very strong role for um, GDP and growth in GDP because ultimately, depending on what your society's preferences are, your economy's preferences for raising revenue and then spending, that gives you the resources that you can then you know, that, that you can then choose how to use those, whether you're a low-income country or a high-income country, your preferences then come in. So I, I would probably always put G, GDP first, not at the expense, say, of the environment and that kind of thing, but GDP, if you, the, the bigger your, your GDP, the bigger your opportunity set or option set for what you then do with that money, whether you, as Gus says, you know, what he'd like to see happen with the health budget, how it was reprioritized. But the more money you have to spend, the more choices you can make. So, I, you know, that probably sounds like a, quite a treasury answer, but I'd start, I'd start with that. Gus. So, um, just to repeat and answer the question, I think number one is mental health. It's got to be. And yeah. Uh, when you look in the book, there's some evidence about, in Denmark, uh, I think it's one in three is mentioned, having uh, mental health episodes during their life of the of population. When you look at the numbers for the UK, uh, it's quite staggering. Uh, the numbers of people who are, have got diagnosed mental diseases who've had absolutely no treatment. Right? That is the staggering uh, uh, work so uh, we we have a lot to do there and and it needn't be that expensive I think picking up the two questions about emerging markets and and poorer countries uh, I think there are two things I'd say there. one is don't ever forget on those charts that were put up the bottom end you know so actually you know there, there are times when you do want to concentrate on increasing income for poorer groups because it does make a big difference uh, so I, I think there's something to be said there. However, there's some really interesting evidence in China when you look at, so China, uh, you know, w when you look at the, we talked about World Bank earlier, the poverty reduction numbers. You know, China's been the greatest poverty reduction engine and, and the growth there. However, um, <clears throat> what you find is the well-being numbers don't, don't move anything like as much. So what you're doing is basically in China and a lot of uh, poorer emerging markets, a rural-urban shift. They've gone from rural areas where actually got, you know, quite happy um, family structures. Uh, the the men, it's usually the men, have moved away to cities uh, and are on their own. And also, their relative income, even though their absolute income has gone up, their relative income has fallen quite dramatically. So they're surrounded by people who are much wealthier than them. Uh, the family structure is not there to support, and so their well-being actually goes down, even though their income's gone up. And I think some of the ways that poorer countries have developed, you take China and you take the problems with air pollution, India as well, they begin to realize that some of the things they were doing were too focused on a very narrow concept of GDP. And I think if you actually took a well-being approach to those, yes, you'd be trying to uh, increase jobs and incomes, in a, but you do it in a rather different way, and it would give you a different policy mix. Eugenia. Do you want to come in on any of those questions? Don't yeah. feel obliged to come in on First all of those. First of all, it's um, what makes people happy. Um, mm. Something very strong is not being unemployed. is a very strong determinant of happiness. Unemployed people are feel very bad and they don't adapt to unemployment. You adapt to everything. Even when you lose a kid, you adapt. But the only thing you don't adapt is being unemployed. For some reason, we cannot adapt to be considered useless in the mm -hmm. society. So I think it is a very important thing to point out. It's a very, very strong result. Uh, considering uh, low developing countries, as I said before, GDP is good because you know increase a lot of things, uh, opportunity, and, um, and then you can look at that. You can be pay attention to that more than probably in developed countries. But it's true that you have very interesting dynamics like the one Gus uh, pointed out. Last point, 
does money make people happy? Uh, I, I, yes. Okay, so the answer is yes. Don't get me wrong. Individual income makes people happy, okay? Especially if you're very poor. Increasing a bit the income makes people happy, okay? So, so it's GDP that do not make people happy, but individual income does make people happy, okay? So it's better to avoid to, to be too romantic. Yeah, about this. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel, do you want to offer yeah, any thoughts? Just a couple, a couple of few things, just not much, but um, I think going back to our research, we, we can answer this question, what increases happiness? In fact, not just our research, but there's been decades now research into this, and so we, can, we have a list, and many of the things that have been mentioned in this, in this table talk to that. So we, know, we do know mental health is extremely important. And if you look at our long-run data, what we, we're using longevity because it's one of the few measures that goes back long enough for us to compare it with our, with our measure of happiness. But that measure really captures um, big, big ticket issues. So it's, it's things like mortality, but mortality in terms of physical and mental health they're very closely linked. So we do know that those two things are very closely linked. Um, um, there was a mention of unemployment as well. That's also extremely important. Inequality is very important too, and we've heard mention of loneliness. I was at the ONS last week. They kindly invited me to deliver a plenary address there. And one of the nice things was I got there early and I got to see some posters. And one of the nicest posters was actually this discussion about childhood well-being. And there's some great ONS data on childhood well-being out there. And there's, there's the Understanding, Understanding Society survey includes a lot of information about, about kids, which is really important. I, I was being a little flippant when I stood up there, but there was a wonderful poster by the ONS actually pointing out that social media does actually damage childhood health. So childhood happiness, sorry. And it's partly to do with this issue, which is loneliness is one of the great problems as far as happiness is concerned, yeah. but also excessive use of social media. Mm -hmm. And I think it relates to the fact that happiness is a relative concept. So seeing others um, talking about various things, celebrities and how, how marvellous their lives are, et cetera, et cetera, this can be quite challenging for young kids out there. And so that, that's something quite important. Um, the issue with developing nations, absolutely, GDP does matter when you're at the bottom end of the, of the spectrum. It also matters in developed nations, because remember what Argenia was talking about was the average. Mm. So when we're dealing with a country which has a high level of income inequality, it's definitely true that people at the bottom end of the spectrum are still going to be interested in increases in GDP. So I think one of the nice things that's happened recently, maybe people like Thomas Piketty are very important in this, is perhaps shifting the focus away from the average and looking at the bottom end of the distribution. Because when you're dealing with widening levels of inequality, it's not necessarily the national average that matters. And while we've always sort of assumed that there's a trickle down, if GDP goes up, everyone benefits, it's now not so clear. Although I think um, Dave made a very important point, which is we do need the money somehow. So in that sense, GDP is always going to be central. And I always say when people ask me that GDP is a little bit like a budget constraint, the production possibility frontier, if you like. And that happiness maybe is a point measure of the utility function. It's telling you where, we, where people happen to be. But in order to really boost that, maybe they need resources. And one thing that happiness economics is telling us is where to spend that money. So maybe things like mental health, et cetera. So the two are not at loggerheads. They really should be moving together. Okay, and that's definitely the case for developing nations and even the case for nations that are sort of beyond that point on the curve too. Thank you. Right. I'm going to come back out to you for some more questions. Vera. So let me be a little bit provocative. A, first thing about the gender balance. If we didn't have events in the evening and I'm on the clock, I'm paying a pound for every five minutes that are going on here, then we might have more mothers here as well. So, but back to the topic. Um, so, so you have measured happiness or you have talked about happiness in very different ways, right? So you said, happiness, you said satisfaction, you said personal well-being. And from my perspective, all these things are very different things, right? Satisfaction is different from happiness and from well-being. And so maybe we, we also have to distinguish how we measure these kind of different aspects of personal well-being. And, uh, and that was not talked about at all, in, and also not, uh, I didn't see it at least in, in how we measure happiness. The other thing is, and that's even more provocative, I think, is um, to, what, to what end? Why do we want people to be happy, right? <laughs> so um, uh, you, you need to tell me, right, we are measuring happiness, but uh, why, uh, what is happiness increasing in, uh, in <coughs> on average? Right? Is it increasing GDP or is it increasing? Do people like to go to work more often or do they like working more? You know, there's a huge 
kind of heterogeneity is the equivalent one. You say, okay, I'm, unemployment makes me more happy, but also being more happy is probably reversely related to not being unemployed and trying to find work and so on. So it's not just the heterogeneity issue that I'm talking about. But I really want to know why we are interested in people being satisfied and happy um, from a more general, you know, economic, um, general societal point of view. So basically, um, if, if I might paraphrase, um, you, you think these guys are cheating by <laughs> running lots of different ways of talking about happiness together and sort of grouping it all as, as kind of one measure, whereas actually there might be lots of very, very different things going on. Um, some more questions. Yep, go ahead. We were talking all about, I guess, what you call official sources of data, so are we need data to talk about a lot. I'm a little bit interested in what you might call unofficial sources of data, so there's so many things going on out there that impact on the well-being of individuals and communities. Is there a role for this kind of data even in measuring well-being and using that for policy making, and how might that be captured? Great. Thank you very much. Daniel, go for it. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and say a few words on each of those things. So absolutely, Vera, there are many different many different ways to measure happiness and very many different definitions. And if you talk to a psychologist about this, you'll be talking for hours. So, um, And of course, we added something new. Our measurement is technically word valence, which is another way of measuring happiness. But I think there are two things. Many of these measures are very, very highly correlated. So our measure, which is looking at word in te words in texts, correlates very closely with measures of life satisfaction. We know that in some domains, they're all correlated. In other domains, they drift apart. And particularly when you're thinking about the difference between the short run and the long run. Mm -hmm. So I think there's probably one of the most useful divisions is to think about instantaneous or short run versus your entire life. And many of the questions that we have in surveys get at both of these things. And I actually think it's possible to tackle them independently. So you can think about that in terms of the way I divided it up. Um, there are some things which we know have a powerful short-run impact and some things which have a powerful long-run impact. And you have to consider both because, of course, in the long run, we're all dead, as Keynes said. But also, um, I think of happiness also as a stock. So if you have a brief period of intense unhappiness, that is just as important as a long period of, of slightly suboptimal unhappiness, if you like. So there's a role for looking at these measures as independent targets for policy. Um, why is happiness important? Well, I... I'm not going to say I think that's self-evident, but I think what happiness is almost by definition what many people would like to maximise. It's almost the same as utility, not quite. I mean, it's almost the same. Um, but p possibly if you believe Aristotle, maybe it's the meaning of life. Right? I mean, Confucius, Aristotle. So in, in, a, in, a, in a sense, um, if it's not happiness, what else is it? So you could say, well, what about caring about other people, for example? But then warm glow. We know that if, if that's important to you, that will give you personal happiness too. So if you care about others, that, that can be reflected in it. Maybe that's not enough, and we, uh, but luckily we have many different ways of measuring happiness, as you've also pointed out. So some of those, at least some of those, I hope you think will be quite important. Okay, so um, there was another question, which was, let me tackle the big, the, the, the data question. Are, are the unofficial measures of, of well-being useful? Well, I, actually our measure is sort of that. So what we're doing is we're, we're using big data. So big data, if you don't know it, is two things. One is it's an enormous quantity. So when I mentioned hundreds of billions of words, that has to be described as big in any, in any serious way. But the other beautiful thing about big data is it's a sort of side effect. So the stuff that people do on the internet in terms of collecting data isn't designed to generate well-being data. But as a side effect, we can, we can use that data to generate it. So we can look at other things too. We can look at blogs, we can look at tweets, we can look at Facebook, and we can try and work out how happy people are by using those sorts of measures. So those are unofficial. I think they're useful. But, as, but the problem is they have to be dealt with quite in quite a rigorous and consistent way because, of course, as we know, if there are many different sorts of data out there, then you can select which one you want to demonstrate or prove something. So we've got to be very careful that people aren't allowed the freedom to, make, to abuse the great variety of data that's out there. Um, the final issue about culture, I'll, I could pass that on to Roger. Yeah, no, I, I was going to suggest that Eugenia takes so, that one. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, um, cultural effect, yes, there are pervasive cultural effects. In fact, if you, if my, first, my first slide, the one, is, is a, we use a technique, a fixed effect, to take <laughs> away the effect of culture. Because you know, some culture they declare themselves happier, some culture less. For example, South American, they, they tend to say that they are extremely happy, and you know, maybe a bit the effect of the culture. While uh, uh, Brits, 
tend to be a bit more understated. Actually, <laughs> the uh, very rich Brits, they never say are the level 10, the lowest level. They just, you know, it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very interesting. The last level of happiness, for example, is happiness measured by one and 10, the highest income point, point, point are of Brits, they never say 10. You know, it, it's very strong that actually, it's very impressive, that's culture. Um, but I would like to say something about measurement. Um, effectively, you can easily easily characterize the question on well-being on more uh, emotional and more rational, okay, in a scale, and then mix between the two. So there are several questions. One, they measure more an emotional well-being. Another is more evaluative well-being. And in this respect, I'm impressed because the English government is measuring all a battery of of a, of a question of a, uh, well-being, so which which is pretty impressive. So I, I'm very very pleased about that. Um, another point about Vivera's endogeneity. Uh, we have a paper with uh, Daniel and um, Andrew Oswald showing, in fact, that you can run from happiness to productivity, and it seems to be an effect. If, if you're happy, you're more energized. Uh, you're more productive, which is a very important point. So you you don't have to, like Daniel say, happiness is an objective per se. Yes, but it's also a good thing to do if you are if you pay attention to productivity in this respect. Management are, are starting to be more and more sensible about this idea. You know, whenever I go to give a conference, they are very open to the idea of workers' well-being. And if I remember correctly, that research was done with Warwick University students, wasn't it? Yes. yes. Um, so and happier Warwick University students are more productive in the tests that they're given as part of the experiment than unhappy ones. And, and uh, the, the, the guy to make to, to the shock to make them happy is Bill Bailey. So they died. Right. Really yeah. So it's, it's yeah. very interesting. Okay, great. Um, Dave, I'm going to come to you and then Gus, I'll give you the mm. final word. Um, <coughs> not really much mm. to add to... to to what others have, have said about the links between um, uh, certain happiness measures and particularly um, the factors relating to, to, to mental health um, through to well-being and through to, through to productivity. I think that's a really interesting um, set of findings. And as Eugenio said, it links to, links to management, but it also links to kind of wider culture, uh, workplace culture, for example. I mean, one of what's really striking about the official data, and this is not to downplay other data, but it is available at every level. So I don't know if Warwick University surveys its, <laughs> its, its faculty or students, but across the civil service, we put these four questions mm -hmm. from the ONS in our, in our surveys. Um, so we in the Treasury, as part of how we manage the Treasury, can look at and you know, we have something like a 90 percent response rate so we can get some really decent results from our a thousand staff we get their assessment of their of those four dimensions of well-being so it, it can be very rich at, at different yeah. levels in the in in the economy um and 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 then when you go up the next level i mean just read it again that as i said i think it's a great primer but the the summary of well-being in the uk <coughs> Uh, para, uh, page 34, there's a little pink box saying what the first five years of the ONS data show at the regional and national level. People living in London report lower average ratings of life satisfaction. I mean, I mentioned how high Northern Ireland was. You know, something's going on in London. And then uh, I think we saw this in the very long time series of Daniels, although it was a, a slightly different, as he says, it was a, a word valence based measure. UK well-being was on an upward trend from 2012 to 2016, but in that last year of that period, improvement in ratings for happiness, anxiety, and the feeling that things in life are worthwhile came to a stop. Now, you know, who know as, a, as a macroeconomist, I'd be interested, you know, is there, is, is there anything material happening there, or is it, is, it, you know, is it just a fluctuation in the data, and that's why we need more and more data to understand these things, but I think back to Vera's point, um, you know, there, there are, there is actually quite a different, you know, the, you can put different values on these different measures, you can create new measures, but also as others have said, you can just come back to the kind of essence of what life is about and, 
you know, <laughs> and see that well-being is mapping across to that in a way that GDP just isn't for any individual. You know, I don't measure myself by my 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 contribution to GDP. I measure myself by my sense of well-being on different dimensions. Gus, the, just to start with that first question about you know what what are we. Uh, why do we care about uh, happiness? I think it's fundamentally important. This whole debate should really start with the philosophers, right? And I didn't mention them in the multidisciplinary, so I've got to get them in now. Um, because economists basically have a, a model which is pretty much a utilitarian philosophy. You know, maximize utility subject to constraints. We're maximizing overall sum of utility. And that has its advantages. It's certainly incredibly easy to be uh, to analytically tractable and all the rest of it. But it's also got some disadvantages, uh, which Sen and others have pointed out. So if you actually want to look at this, I haven't got time to go into it, you should really start from the philosophy and think about what constitutes, what constitutes to you success, what constitutes society success. And remember that the, the biggest criticism is, well, if you want to make people happy, just lower their aspirations. That will be fine. You know, Indian caste system, for example. So you need to be robust to those sorts of issues. Right? And, and there's perfectly good ways of handling all of that. The Costa Ricans have a phrase, pura vida, right? which is kind of, that's what it's all about. The good life, the kind of, you know, and, and they, they've really got it. So go there and that'll sort it out. And, and that's why culturally it is slightly different in certain places and you need to understand. And the language matters in China. The word harmony is used quite often for, you know, as, as a translation of some of this stuff. And in, on, finally, on unofficial data, uh, the geographers, another discipline that's in, into this world, um, have got some data called Mappiness, uh, where they're basically asking people uh, various times in the day, uh, how do you feel? One of these happiness questions, one to ten, and take a picture of where you are. So they're looking at the effect of your physical environment on the overall sense of your happiness. And what they're finding is people are outside, have got a view of trees or water, tends to make you feel better. And we're starting to think about how those sorts of things should be applied in the National Health Service, where it actually turns out that people who are in a hospital with a better view get, get better quicker than those who haven't. So there's, there's some practical applications of all this. But I think I, I've got a slight worry with the, um, the words, the two centuries of data on words. <laughs> I'm just wondering about all those non-readers, their well-being. Where was that picked up in... 200 years ago. So, you know, I think with all of the non traditional ways, you know, we've got the statos being very careful about our sampling methods and all the rest of it. But when we start going into non traditional methods, we've got some other issues which we need to work through. Just to be clear, there are some. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad you mentioned philosophy. My, my training is as a philosopher rather than as an economist. And so, Martia Sen, I think, definitely, but also Martha Nussbaum, I think. For me, if you want to begin to explore the philosophical literature on this, that, that's a good place to start. We've run very slightly over time. Um, I apologize for that. And I apologize to the people who wanted to ask questions and didn't get a chance. Come now and grab the speakers um, before they go. Um, thank you very much to everybody for coming. And please join me in thanking our panelists. Okay. Let's see now, please.